Okay, so your brother's managing the band. Your brother Miles is managing the band. Is Miles saying, these are the songs I think we should do? Or is it, whose decision? Is it the labels? How did you decide things back then? Uh, Miles just uh, offering brotherly advice. Yep. Uh, he was very generous in that way. Um, he just couldn't appear to be promoting his brother rather than Chelsea and Squeeze and all these other bands that he had going on. And he just said, well, that's crap. Uh, that's crap. But it has, you know, it's Brechty and it has, I don't give a shit. Who's, who's that? I don't care. It's crap. Uh, no one's going to like that. Um, and so we, he got rid of tracks and then the gap soon to be filled by superior material coming from one Gordon Sumner. Uh, and he never told us what tracks we should put on, but he was very good at picking the hit, the single. Now that should be the single. And he was in dispute very often with not just the police, but with the Bangles, with the Go-Go's, with you know, all of the different groups, what's the single? And they would insist on their version, and he didn't pick a fight because that would be their excuse to not promote it. So he'd let them have the f choice of the first single, whatever would happen, but then his, he gets the second choice, and right. that would be the hit. Many yeah. times that happened. He had better ears than the record company. Okay, so let the label do their thing so that they're happy, because if you argue with them, they'll shelve your record. Well, not basically. so much shelve it is that's, well, you didn't listen to us. Yeah. You know, it just kind of gives them a, an excuse, a get out. You know, whereas if you go with their idea, they're more committed to making that work. Stuart, you don't know any of the police lyrics. I do know. Uh, I never listened to them at the day. You know, I'm just banging shit, the back, and all I ever see is the back of his head. Uh -huh. If I see the front of his head, that's not a good thing. No. Because he's usually turning around to yell at me for something. <laughs> uh, and so um, I prefer the back of his head when mm -hmm. we're on stage. Um, that means systems are go, we're all good. Um, and so no, I never listened to lyrics. But years later, I took some of those songs and orchestrated them and created a show called Police Deranged for Orchestra, where I have three soul sisters on the mic singing the lyrics. And to organize them uh, and to do the arrangements, I discovered two things. Andy was a motherfucker with those voicings, the chords and the stuff that he, you know, I saw them with their heads together mumbling F sharp minor or whatever the fuck they were talking about to each other. Musical does. <laughs> and uh, between the two of them, those guitar parts have such harmonic complexity. Yes. And Andy did do the voicing, um, which is a big part of it. So I came to really appreciate Andy's contribution musically. But also, I had my nose rubbed in those lyrics. Oh, that's what he's singing about. That's kind of cool. I get it. Uh, I, never, I never really bothered with them at the time, but years later, I did have to come to the realization, <clears throat> and don't tell him I said this, but that fucker's a genius. I used to say about your drumming that you are the master of the non-fill fill. Like on um, Wrapped Around Your that's Finger. That's noir. On Wrapped Around Your Finger. When it goes into, like, the first chorus, and do doom, do doom, flam, and that's it. A lot of times you'll use just the simplest thing to announce the chorus. Or not. Or not. In that song particularly, I didn't know anything. Where's the verse? Where's the chorus? I don't know. They're just grooving away there, and then it's, some, you know, something's changed. And so I think I'd do that flam one bar late, and then we cut the tape to put it in the right place. But I mean, I didn't know the song. That's the one, the, the worst casualty of me not knowing what's, what, what are we doing here? And I'm just playing something and there was this synthesizer, dear, dear. I didn't, and, and what I could make out of the lyric, I, you know, I, I, I didn't get it um, at the time. That's my least favorite of all the songs he wrote. Did you play with clicks ever? No, ever. Oh, well, actually, no. Um, Defining the click more broadly, uh, some of the songs had a synthesizer pattern. Okay. Uh, such as synchronicity, whichever, I forget. Synchronicity what, the, one. The one that goes diddle, 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 yes. diddle, diddle. Okay, now that's a, yeah. a pattern yeah. in a loop. So we played to that. Okay, and what was that synthesizer? And by the way, remember? no, we did a bunch of takes not with that. Okay. Which didn't work. Okay. Um, and so we ended up doing it to the loop. I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. This will help me get even more of my dream guests and help continue to grow both channels. Thank you.
Then he switched over to using his fingers because that's what the jazz cats do. And was that during the we had conversations that? about this? You didn't like the sound of it, right? I preferred his plectrum. Yeah, and it's so uncool and it's so like white trash to use a plectrum on bass. Very punk rock, though. Very well. Yeah, a lot of you know so, Paul certain McCarty. songs. You know, uh, bring on the night. You cannot play that with your fingers, motherfucker. You wrote the song, and I'm telling you. You can't, you, you know, that's a plectrum against the, going up and down on the string. You know, this just doesn't cut it. I want to ask you about every little thing she does is magic. There's a story that goes with that, right? There was, a, there was an argument or what? I don't, I don't know this story, but I want to know this story. Is this a demo that you're playing with? Yes. Uh, Sting probably wanted to keep that for a solo album or something. It was, it was, at that time, it was his most obvious hit song. Okay. And I recall the first iteration of it was actually in a bus in 1970, early 1978, on the way down to the Mont de Marceau Punk Festival, and we're on a bus with The Clash, The Damned, and several other crap English punk bands for two days on a bus from London down to south of France to play this festival down there, which is a heck of a story right there. But he had this, this couplet, every little thing she does is magic. And it was sort of like a rebellion. He's at the back of the bus with all these snarly punks. And the only one he got along with was actually Paul Simonon, who, and they were talking about bass technique, you know, out of earshot <laughs> of uh, the rest of the clash, you know, because he didn't want anyone in the band to know that he actually gave a shit about his instrument and was talking to Sting about, should your fingers be in that position? And, oh, really? You know, because all three of us had chops. Right. And all three of us would have, you know, the, the young musicians would, were bigger fans yeah, of the band than musicians. the critics. The critics wrote us off as carpetbaggers, which was true, but the, the players would come and cop our chops. Right. Uh, and uh, Paul and Stingo bonded over bass technique, you know. But anyhow, he, he, so he had that hook back in 1978. But his problem was, as I remember him saying, that, what are your rhymes with magic? Uh, pelagic. Uh, and he figured out a way of using tragic. Tragic, you know, yes. You know, which is sort of a, doesn't fit, you know, my life with you would be tragic, is like, eh, still one of his best songs he ever wrote. Yeah. So the song was kind of in the background forever. Yeah. And one time uh, in a hiatus or gap between albums, he went off to Montreal and he ran into this keyboard player. Uh, what was his name? Jean Roussel, French Canadian musician. And um, they created this track in the studio that was like a, a hit. And um, his arm was twisted probably by Miles, okay. who would have heard the song. Yep. He wouldn't have played it for Andy and me. Yeah. Uh, because he had, his own, and Miles said, no, you <laughs> fucking put that on a police album. Come on, pull it out, pull it out. And he pulls it out and we go, oh, that's a hit. And we tried every which way to policeify it because, you know, of course it's a hit like that, but that's not the point. Uh, we're a man. And so we tried to. Wait, did it this, have demo drums on it or something like program? Oh, it had drums? everything on it. Yeah. Okay. Not drum, drum, drum box. Drum know. box. Yeah. Yeah. And so we tried the punk version. We tried the reggae version. We tried this, but none of them. Everything that we did to policeify it made it less of a hit. And finally, um, one morning, uh, caffeinated. Uh, okay, motherfucker, just just play me your demo. Just play me your demo, and I'll show you how playing like a click, which would amount to be playing with a click. Just, just run your demo down. You can stand here, tell me when the chorus is coming up. So we're both grumpy and we, you know, we've just been arguing. Okay, play like that. And he played down this song. Every little thing she does is, and he's standing. Oh. <laughs> and uh, that was one take right there uh, with him standing over me saying, okay, chorus, you know, and him kind of flagging the changes. And uh, me in a, you know, over caffeinated grump. Um, to demonstrate how this ain't gonna work, uh, and it kind of did.